Well, I think welcome. Uh, welcome to Open Source Recipes for Chef Deployments of Hadoop. I'm Clay Benziger. I'll be talking about how we at Bloomberg deploy our Hadoop clusters. In particular, Bloomberg, we're a very open company. So I want to explain. We've open sourced all of these recipes. For us, we bring transparency to the financial markets. We want to bring transparency to how we deploy Hadoop. This is rather huge because we're a company with 3,000 software developers. So for us to have a reference implementation of how the Hadoop clusters are deployed across our company is huge to be able to get that communication across and for people to be able to really understand how the stack is built. Also, third parties, why we're all here, to be able to say, hey, yeah, I want to try your component. This is how my cluster is built out. Being able to have exactly how your infrastructure is built out is huge. So that third party integration fit, we want to be able to see all of you here to be able to say, hey, my cluster is built out this way, and we can compare notes. Hiring, we're all hiring, so it's great. If you like what we're doing, talk to us. And uh, everyone here, thanks to all the Hadoop folks who have open sourced everything that we use on a hopefully daily basis. So this talk is going to walk kind of what we've provided in the open source drop that we've done and uh, what our repos have that we commit to daily. The installation and configuration management principles behind what we've done and how we deploy our clusters. The customization that this provides for us and uh, high availability. Certainly Hadoop's becoming more available, reducing single points of failure, being able to make sure that it withstands more and more Byzantine types of failures every day, and this is fantastic. But we gotta talk about that and look at how the ecosystem's kind of uh, uh, gone different directions and, and how we handle that. And lastly, integration with the cloud. We run our own OpenStack systems. We are a cloud provider within the company. Um, this is huge because we also then have Hadoop. You know, thousands of computers running side by side with slightly different workloads, but otherwise really similar. So what we provide, some open source chef recipes on GitHub. This is huge for us. Uh, GitHub, you know, we're financial. Normally financials are very quiet. For us, we've got this all in GitHub. We want to see, you know, if you see anything out there you want to recommend a change to, we've got issues, we've got commits, please. Um, Take a look at these. You'll notice at the bottom of the slides, bloomberg.github.io, excuse me, bloomberg.github.io slash chef bcpc slash Hadoop. These are our OpenStack recipes as well as our Hadoop recipes. We try to focus on big top-based distributions. We want to be relatively vendor agnostic so that we can try the latest upstream commits as well as whatever we might be getting for support. This is a, a rather important distinction because we don't want to be tied to one-offs here or there, but Big Top provides us as a community this how is everything actually going to fit together. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got a question for can I define Big Top. Um, let me hold that to the end. I suspect we'll have a fair Q&A, but uh, otherwise, uh, the supporting infrastructure too. If you're running Hive, you definitely need a, a database of some sort. If you're running Uzi, you need a database of some sort. That may not be a Hadoop provided component. So, that supporting infrastructure, how do you deploy it? That's huge. And for us, the same deployment on VirtualBox, on OpenStack VMs, and on bare metal is really useful. We've got, again, 3,000 software engineers. We don't want to have to deal with, uh, with trying to be able to uh, have different stacks for different uses. Um, similarly, being able to pixie boot the machines and then actually walk through to an application deployment, this gives us the ability to to fully understand you know, the way it builds out on VirtualBox is the same way it builds out on our, our bare metal. Lastly, the composable components. Our stack supports uh, roughly nine of the Hadoop ecosystem components. We want to be able to say, hey, I want HDFS on this cluster. Maybe it's just a data lake. It sits there, it's data stored, it's, it's kept safe. And then something else might say, hey, I want a low latency H-based cluster. We need to be able to take that HDFS, put it underneath, tune it appropriately. Same thing, stack H-base on top. So the composable components are, are rather huge. Um, actually, one last thing. I want to give you guys some, some idea about Bloomberg here. Uh, we've got 3,000 software engineers, but we're also a financial and news company. If you're unaware, never heard of Bloomberg. Uh, we've got 2,400 news reporters. Uh, these folks are going out in the field generating content every day. We've got to be able to index that. We've got to be able to analyze that. We've got tens of millions of securities. You know, if you want to buy a, an Apple share of equity, that's fantastic. If you want to buy a very complex derivative that's somehow linked to the housing market and the chair you're sitting on, that's fantastic too. I'm sure there's probably one out there. We have to track all of that. 
we have to be able to provide all of that. And so that's where Hadoop for us comes in because who knows how something's gonna be structured today if it's gonna be structured that way tomorrow. Um, so again, the motivation of Bloomberg for us is multiple clusters. So for us, we've got development clusters where, sorry, uh, where we've got development clusters where we're rolling out changes, we wanna test out a new uh, Hadoop ecosystem component, we've got development component clusters where we wanna test out performance, we've got development clusters where we wanna run Chaos Monkey and we wanna see how things fail. We wanna look at, if we take down this Zookeeper node, how long does it take to reconverge? If we start pumping lots of data through that Zookeeper node, does it take the same amount of time to reconverge? Data lakes for us are rather large. Um, we've got financial data that's usually very sensitive to some people. We've gotta be able to put that into a data lake, be able to say, hey, yeah, you can, you can do analytics on that, but we can't, we can't actually uh, otherwise put that on the same cluster that might be serving our website. So we've gotta be able to, to be able to split things off. Low latency is also huge for us. Financial, financial markets run in microseconds, we have to be able to as well. HBase provides us that ability, but we have to be able to have a cluster that can do that. Again, that data sensitivity, all clusters uh, in financial world, I'm sure anyone who deals with PII can really appreciate data is sensitive. You gotta be able to split that up. So we've got deployment consistency in this case, is we can take what our developers do and be able to say, hey, yeah, great, you wanna test on HBase 098 or you wanna test on the, the latest trunk of HBase, go ahead. But then we can pull back and we can actually have a vendor who says, well, I only work with this component, not a problem we can actually release our code and, and let them jump on. Similarly, application teams. Again, with thousands of engineers walking around wanting to be able to deploy onto these clusters, we have to provide them some way to be able to, to actually interface with those clusters. And you can't have a million people being cluster admins. So as such, we can provide them chef recipes that allow them to set up HDFS directories. We can allow them to be able to, to actually start or stop a service as they need, but without having those cluster privileges. It's, it's all code, they can merge it in, we can review it, just like any software project we otherwise run. And for us, the bare metal deployments are huge. As with any large company, we have different networks, and I'm sure you do as well. So when you say, hey, yeah, I can build this on my laptop, that's fantastic. When you say, okay, I can build this in the test lab, well, that's fantastic. When you say, yeah, I can operate this in a data center, well, are you sure about that? You know, do, you have, do you have access to the internet? Do you have access to, to whatever network you thought you needed? For us, we can deploy on a Vagrant VM. So we can set up our VirtualBox process to deploy on a Vagrant VM and to test out virtual machines as though they're actual bare metal. But I can take that same Vagrant VM and I can actually put it on a bare metal machine. And I can just connect it in and now I can pixie boot a cluster of machines. This ability to take a golden image of a cluster and to be able to roll it out is really important for us. Hopefully a development pattern that I'd like to see, uh, see more folks using. So installation and configuration management is a huge topic. Uh, anyone who's gone to ChefConf or uh, any of the analogs for, for other, other technologies, there's 20 plus projects now in the uh, Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, it's really unfathomable when you start thinking about all the configuration files, all the XML files. How many log4j files do you have on your cluster today? Being able to actually make sense of that in one place is really useful. So for us, our code job roughly 2,500 lines of XML configurations, all your dash site XMLs, all of, all of your various dash env.shs are, are in here. But regardless, that 2,500 lines of XML, you've gotta put somewhere and you've gotta have some way to have a consistent, you know, what's your Zookeeper cluster? So that comes in this, uh, this, code, this code ecosystem. We've got 1,000 lines of Hadoop setup that's done through Ruby. Chef is entirely a Ruby-driven Ruby ecosystem, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about Chef a little bit more. But what you run here is, is gotta be, you know, the state machine to set up HDFS HA, to set up your, your yarn cluster and be able to actually get the resource manager and the, the history server talking together it has to be done in Ruby. So that's a, roughly a thousand lines right now. And we're able to support 10 plus components with that thousand lines. We've got 1600 lines of base setup Ruby. So this is that infrastructure for a Hadoop cluster that most people kind of forget about. Like, oh yeah, I've, I've got a relational database. I'm sure it was really fine. Got a relational database. I'm sure my H catalog data, yeah, it's fine. But we've got MySQL Galera, so it's a multi-master HA MySQL. We've got Graphite and Zabbix as our monitoring stack. 
Nagios or uh, OpenTSDB can be plugged in as well. So that 1600 lines is pretty powerful. Unfortunately, we have 550 lines of shell script. I'm not a big fan of shell script, but this is how you install your cluster. So this is your cobbler boot for Pixie. This is your you know, orchestration of just which machine is going to get what profile. And so with that, let's kind of step back and look at that complexity if we didn't have all of the, the code. This is just a dependency graph of six of the Hadoop components. Here we've got um, HBase, which depends on HDFS. We've got Yarn, which depends on HDFS. We've got Zookeeper, that's actually pretty independent. We've got MapReduce, we've got Hive and HCatalog and Uzi. These all have just a, a complex dependency structure and we haven't even gotten yet to the configuration. We've got seven different, excuse me, six different daemons for HDFS. They've gotta be started in order. Uh, if you change a configuration file, you've gotta then bounce certain daemons, but maybe not others, because you don't wanna bring your cluster down. So all of that can be orchestrated through this code. So talking simply about Chef, what is Chef? It's infrastructure as code. Uh, in our case, uh, in our case, uh, the deployment and configuration management that it provides for us is, is key. So Chef is Ruby code. We can work with any developer tool that you would normally use for your software engineering effort. And it's simpler to, similar to pump it, Ansible, Salt, CF Engine, et cetera. So we went with Chef because we like the primitives it provided us. You could go with any of these others. Big Top, for example, has a Puppet uh, setup for being able to deploy its, its components. However, for us, they didn't meet our needs for the cluster orchestration. Uh, we've got Chef for our OpenStack clusters that are also part of this open source code drop, so it makes sense for us to continue on with it. And Bari's fantastic, and it's definitely growing every, every day I look at it. But this is a little more bra, and the fact that you can actually install the bare metal, you can install all of the ecosystem components that are not really Hadoopy, uh, you know, the, the MySQL, the metric stack, and all that, which quite often has system level components. Okay, that's fantastic that I've got inf information on my H base, but I also wanna see what my network statistics are doing. And I, I, you know, my network is maybe a three free system network where I've got my management and I've got my storage, and then I've got actually what's coming into the cluster. And so to be able to actually extend the ecosystem, this is more raw than Mbari. You don't have nice knobs uh, that you can just twiddle in a, a, a graph. But at the same time, you can break it open and, uh, and all the pieces are there. This op leverages the open source Chef server as well. Uh, Chef has some proprietary components. This is entirely open source. So Chef provides us a mature ecosystem in that we've got community cookbooks. We can leverage, for example, uh, sysconfig or a sudo or a java cookbook if we want to try to change some component of this ecosystem. We've got Ruby gems so that we can actually leverage the entire Ruby ecosystem such as webhdfs or zookeeper. All of those are available in our configuration management system which makes the configuration management system as powerful as the ecosystem very easily. We've got um, similarly raw actions that we can run such as a directory provider or a directory provider or otherwise a, a template. And cluster orchestration features. We can actually s search by nodes and say, I wanna see all nodes that are HDFS uh, data nodes. I wanna see all nodes that are name nodes and be able to return those so we can use that as code in say an XML file or we can use that as code for making a for loop just walking over and seeing system health. We can also search by recipes so that we can figure out, okay, which machines have had the JVM upgraded to 1.7 being able to actually look at all that in one place is, is huge. And it provides error handling. Anyone who's, who's had to take a shell script based approach for installing their Hadoop cluster, every once in a while, oh yeah, that, that doesn't exit with non-zero, it just produces something to standard error. Those types of things can be handled through Chef very easily and that just provides, comes out of the box. So walking through some of these Chef idioms, a node definition, what does it actually look like when Chef is, is showing you what one of your, your cluster nodes is? And here we see uh, this nice example.com machine and it's running in cluster one. So already we've got some metadata about the machine that tells us where this machine is, maybe physically or at least uh, hierarchically. We've got then a breakdown. In our case, we tend to set up our machines with three different networks. This has been a challenge with the Hadoop ecosystem, just what port do you wanna bind a daemon to? what port do you want to actually query for getting UI information versus actually getting an RPC call through. And so that's all handled here. 
We've got uh, these discovered components, such as the IP address, which are handled by Chef's OHI component. Um, you can get you know, system processor disks in partic particular if you've got a heterogeneous cluster and you have to, to structure it. So you get the discovered components, you get defined components, such as environments and roles, which are Chef idioms for being able to take a structure of information and maybe a cluster definition and be able to actually ship that with you or being able to take a role and say, well, this is what I want to have on all of my machines that are running as name nodes, or this is what I want to have on all my machines that are resource managers. Similarly, here you can see that in the gateway addresses uh, coming from the environment. That would be something that the machines themselves aren't going to be able to determine and, and discover, so that's a defined component. And then we've got computed, computed information, such as what the recipes can provide back. And here the structure of what interface is a management interface, what interface is a floating interface, those are all things that are defined by recipes and written back to the node so that it's stored on the server. Another idiom that we've found incredibly powerful is searching for nodes by recipes. This isn't the cleanest of code when you first look at it, but if you understand that Chef lets you search for key and a search pattern, then you can start to realize, oh, I want to find all recipes from a particular cookbook, and I want to find all nodes that are in this particular chef environment. So I want to look for cluster one, and I want to find all machines which are name nodes that are defined in the BCPC Hadoop cookbook. And that really makes it a lot nicer. There's some, some handling here because of the fact that this always goes back to the chef server, so we have to look and actually understand that that node object might be in memory and we haven't provided it back, so the local, local host is an edge case. And one thing, whenever you start to write chef recipes, puppet recipes, or otherwise, you always have to order your host. If you're bouncing your daemons every time you change a configuration file and you sort today that machine A, machine C, and machine D, and tomorrow it comes back from the server as machine B, machine C, machine D, and it's out of order, then you're going to bounce that daemon, and there's no need. So you always have to sort. Luckily for our end users, those deployment application deployers, uh, application teams, they simply get nodes four, and they get all of that data back. Similarly, for service verification, this is a, a pattern I love from, from Seth Fargo's uh, work on the Jenkins Community Cookbook for Chef. And here we can see that we're actually able to query Uzi, which the startup scripts for a lot of the Hadoop daemons will allow you to start the service. You can have a configuration file typo. It says, oh yeah, the daemon's running, it's all good. And then it bombs out two seconds later. You go, wait, why is my cluster down now? So here we can actually put in checks and interlocks that query the service and do an API verification and say, hey, Uzi, are you sure you're alive? Have you connected to your database? Is everything okay? Then you can actually pull for it and make sure, okay, I only wanna give the service so many seconds before I give up on it. And so this gives you a lot of power. But the key part too, Chef always has these guard attributes. You wanna make everything item potent so it only runs the same way every time. And so here we can say, yeah, you can leverage that and just short circuit all of that logic and say, if Uzi's running, I really don't care. Let's just continue on with our lives. The output as an administrator, if you want to be able to actually operate this cluster, you have to know what the cluster's doing and what the, the cluster orchestration scripts are doing. And here we can see again that we, we're going to check if Uzi's up and we're going to run through and we're going to say, oh, you know, I got a connection refused from Uzi. And so that's that verification step in that guard. So that guard fails out and then we have to actually pull for it. And we see here that that pull loop and the verification step, we get normal back afterwards. And this is really powerful to be able to avoid dropping your entire cluster down from a bad configuration change. So the maintenance with any of these kind of large scale systems, we've got to think about maintainability and in particular infrastructure is notorious for being something that can grow and then becomes unwieldy in the end. And to try to leverage some of the software engineering tools that we're used to using, here we've got full developer model, it's Git. It's Ruby. We can use all of the standard developer tools we're used to, and we can similarly hand this to app teams who might be perfectly familiar with their Ruby code for their web projects, but they want a, a back-end database that they store all of their incoming traffic to. They want to be able to actually figure out what their users are doing on their website. So we can hand them that application deployment code. Similarly, we've got Jenkins for static analysis or whatever continuous integration tool you'd like to be able to actually make sure, can I deploy my clusters today? Can I operate my clusters in the way I think so? to be able to walk through that. And lastly, again, we can move that relatively stateless chef server, that Vagrant VM. You can either do it with IP migration if you're, you're loath to actually use the Vagrant VM, or you can use that Vox and just simply VBox export, VBox import, and, and you've actually got that virtual box power for you. So the customization here, 
with ad hoc cluster work, uh, this always happens. You've got a cluster running and someone says, oh, can you just run this one thing across all of your nodes? Or I just need this one off software. Well, next week I can deploy that via Yarn, but you know, today I can't get that out. You know, what have you? Well, in one case, for example, uh, we had a cluster that, that uh, I was operating. It was a nice demo cluster, but uh, unfortunately 100 megabytes from every disk got stripped and XFS didn't like that terribly much. So we had to roll out XFS recover across our entire cluster. Now this is a process that takes you know, a good 60 minutes or so across each node, and you gotta wait for each node to do that. And in this case, the XFS recover steps would be really tedious to run by hand, It'd be really tedious to make sure that it actually ran right, but to roll it out through Chef, not a problem. And that demo cluster was able to be you know, brought back up to the point where we could say, okay, where are we at? What do we have very easily by just being able to add to that recipe? Similarly, every cluster always has those break fix things where it's two in the morning and someone says, I have to be able to do something. Well. With Chef, you've got all of the power of Git, so you can say, well, who's broken into the system? You know, they had to run something? That's fantastic. Well, you don't get sudo all. You know, the, uh, the uh, lint style will actually kick out your change. So instead, you can say, well, but you do have this sudo provider in Chef. You can give yourself whatever commands you want. Just go ahead and do that. It's all checked in. So the customization is really nice and the ability to actually track all of those changes. Similarly, picking and choosing application versions. Uh, for those who went to HBaseCon, We've been enjoying trying to push HBase, but one of the challenges, we've got to run a development version of HBase on our clusters, and we want to be able to roll that out in a way that's seamless to the developers who are actually concerned about the low-lying HBase, and they just want to run their applications on top and see how it works. And so here, we can use a vendor stack and just change out one component, just that HBase recipe that needs to be modified. Similarly, application group deployments. So to be able to make sure that those application groups don't have to understand hey, so what are all the edge cases for creating an HDFS artifact? You know, do I have to worry if the main nodes tell me that they're, one of them's not active? We can just simply provide them a chef action, and they just say, hey, I want a directory. Oh, and by the way, I'd like that directory on HDFS, please. So that's all they have to know. Similarly, Kafka topics. If, if a team comes in and says, hey, I want a new topic in Kafka, you know, I've got a new data source or what have you, that's fine, they should probably control that. They can deploy that through chef. HBase tables are much the same way. So all of these things can just be providers that Chef gives the application team. So next I wanna talk about high availability control points. We cover that in our stack in a number of different ways. One of them is network interfaces. You can do NIC bonding. You don't want a, a topper rack switch to take out 32 machines. You can do NIC bonding and have two topper rack switches for that particular stack of machines. Then you can also do things like virtual IPs. Maybe you've got a core service that itself is stateless, but you always have to make sure all endpoints, all consumers are hitting the same endpoint and that that endpoint changes at the same time. So we use HAProxy in our stack to be able to provide, excuse me, uh, keep alive the, with HAProxy usually to provide that in our stack. Similarly on the MySQL front, you need a multi-master database, something that will allow you to actually ensure that your database nodes can go down and your, your state is consistent. In our case, we, we go with MySQL Galera. Uh, again, that, uh, that state checking recipe is very useful. If with something like MySQL Galera, if it goes down and you wanna be able to figure out, well, what was the last node to go down because that's my most consistent node? Well, it's nice to have Chef be able to say, hey, look, I see the clusters in a bad way, but you might wanna go look at this node because it was the last, last modified file time. Things like that can make it really easy to be able to operate a cluster or really hard to operate a cluster. HDFS, you've got the journal nodes, you've got ZKFC, the zookeeper fencing controller. We do all of that dance by standing up a non-HA name node and then being able to switch it to an HA name node. MapReduce, the resource manager uh, in Hortonworks recently got uh, with 2.1, got the support for being able to do HARM. I believe Cloudera supports it and certainly it's, uh, it's been in the code now. So that resource manager is, is available. HBase similarly, masters are, are a dime a dozen at this point and hopefully will be rolled in. And then Uzi as well. The ability with that MySQL and the virtual IPs, you can layer those two very easily and compose them to provide Uzi HA. The Hive ecosystem, similarly, you've got the history server and you've got your H catalog, web H catalog, excuse me. So I, I wanna stand back for a second and just talk about those HA steps because this is one of the things where it's really awesome that we're, we're getting all of those different technologies to be able to support HA, but some of the state machines can be a little difficult and being able to ensure that they get executed right by someone who's 
you know, been at it for 10 hours installing a bunch of machines in a data center, and then they go, oh, I just have to follow this runbook. Hold on a second, it's 150 pages, and it says step one, two, three. If you do any of these out of order, I'm not quite sure what happens. Here we've got the HDFS HA steps, and uh, this, is, this is somewhat a little frightening. Uh, with Chef, again, because it's, it's software, it'll tirelessly try, and it'll figure out what state is it in, and it will be able to walk through those, those steps appropriately. Again, for us, we operate OpenStack clouds. Um, it's really fantastic, we've got all that code. Also, as part of the Chef BCPC, that's uh, where the BCPC moniker, Bloomberg Clustered Private Cloud, came from. And for us, that cloud integration is fantastic. You can get multi-tenancy, you can get a distributed file system, and you can get a scheduler. The only interesting thing is, that also sounds a lot like the Hattie Pico system. And so for us, we do run OpenStack VMs that have the entire Hattie stack. But one of the questions that starts to become evident when you have three or four or five Hadoop clusters, and for the most part, people are just going, I just want a dev cluster, I don't want to have to worry about you know, this or that, but for the most part, it's all just little stuff that Hadoop takes care of for them. Why, aren't this, why isn't this running on the hypervisors? Why can't I have multi-tenancy provided by Hadoop? It provides multi-tenancy today. Why can't I have the, you know, the, the distributed file system be the same as my OpenStack clouds running? In our case, we use we use Ceph, but HDFS as well. You know, there's, uh, HDFS is getting more performant every release. And to be able to say, okay, we've got the same distributed file system, and at this point, I now no longer need to have VMs on top running a distributed file system on top of a distributed file system. And similarly with the scheduler. The scheduler in OpenStack is going to try to provide the optimal hypervisor for that VM on some policy. Well, similarly, if you're running the capacity scheduler or fair scheduler or maybe a custom scheduler in Yarn, you have your own policy that's going to decide where that container is placed. And with things like Yarn 1964, the JIRA to actually create a Docker VM out of Yarn, and with things like Ceph's work in GitHub to actually stand up a Ceph for HDFS as a, a Hadoop compatible file system, you very quickly get to the point where you can say, well, maybe I can just simply operate my cloud with Hadoop built in. And, uh, and that's one thing that's really awesome with this stack. I'd love to see more people give that a try. I know there's a lot of edge cases out there. Um, with that, we're definitely hiring. Uh, if, uh, if you definitely have any interest in large-scale software development, we've got an interest in it as well. We'd love to find folks who are, uh, who are interested. Uh, Jobs.bloomberg.com, and uh, certainly if you type Hadoop in, it looks like uh, we had 20 results when I did this a, a couple of weeks ago. With that, I suspect there's probably at least a number of questions, so I want to leave some time for Q&A. So I think... Someone over here had a question, and uh, Tahisha will bring you a microphone to ask that question. I have two questions now. Uh, oh. One, could you just clarify the big top? Um, sure. That's not something that most people are familiar with? No problem. Uh, so Apache Big Top is the project to try to standardize on Hadoop packaging in various ways. So if you've used multiple Hadoop distributions, you've probably noticed that you have etsy init.d files for starting a Hadoop name node, and that they take roughly the same options. Uh, in our case, as we're a very HBase focused shop uh, recently, you'll notice that there's a lot of custom options in some of these startup scripts, but they're the same across distributions. And that's really nice. I, I applaud the vendors for not going off on their own, our own way for that. Apache Big Top provides that consistent uh, startup script packaging. Uh, you'll notice that the package names are very consistent uh, between the various vendors as well. And that's not by accident, that's Apache Big Top similarly saying, well, these components make sense to be packaged together. Um, and in all fairness to the Apache Big Top project, because there's a lot of good work there, they have puppet scripts to stand up a lot of this stuff. Um, but there again, for us, with the cluster orchestration that we want to see, it made sense to, to use Chef. So does that help out? It does. And uh, how do upgrades look with Chef? So right now, upgrades are, are something that uh, I would love to talk about, it's just not enough time before the talk. Uh, Current mental model is probably Zookeeper is available. We use Zookeeper today. We use that Zookeeper gem to see if HD, uh, excuse me, to see if ZK of Zookeeper is formatted for the HDFS Zookeeper fencing controller. And to be able to take that Zookeeper and be able to say, hey, I've got a you know a region server that says it's upgrading, and what's my policy? Oh, I can't drop more than two region servers at a time. They put in a, a what's called an ephemeral node in Zookeeper, 
And so that way you could actually do rolling in place upgrades uh, while the stack, I know there's rolling upgrades, uh, I think in HBase and a number of the other core components. But while those are getting dialed out, you can usually take advantage of the fact that these clusters are HA and you can drop a certain number of nodes. So that's where I'd like to see it go. Right now it's not there. Um, From slides, I noticed that uh, you run on Ubuntu distribution. Yes. So what is the chance of running that on slightly different distributions, like CentOS? Sure. For example, like apt-get versus uh, yum. Well, so that's one of the really nice things about Chef. Uh, so Chef, it's actually a package provider. And uh, it knows, oh, hey, he's running on Ubuntu, use, use apt-get. And uh, indeed, that's the reason we, didn't, we weren't able to go with Ambari. Ambari is really nice. But we run Ubuntu on our machines, so we couldn't go with it. Um, but Chef, Chef takes care of that for you. So that packaging provider, as long as the package names are consistent or as long as you've got the right hooks in to use the proper packaging name, it'll say, oh, I'm on an RPM-based system, I should use Yum instead. And we do mirror, uh, so those shell scripts that set up kind of the entire environment, the scripts that set up our, our mirrors do actually uh, mirror apt as well as Yum. So you can, can build it out. We've built out clusters uh, with CentOS a while ago, but uh, I, I admittedly am not quite sure where testing would be on that today. I, I'd love to see it. Uh, there's no reason it couldn't be peer, peer and peer OSs. Uh, from this link, uh, I heard that, uh, I wonder how do you guys control the access to the Chef server? I heard uh, from some SE says that uh, for Chef server, the only kind of account, uh, admin account, so our SE are a little bit uh, scared of giving us any access to the Chef server, which cause troubles for us to have quick deployment of our service and the product into production. Sure, uh, so uh, the, definitely with the Chef server there, the security model, the open source Chef server, the security model is relatively flat. And the way our recipes work, you do have to give a node an admin privilege at some point to be able to write to data bags that store things like passwords and, and other configuration that needs to be persisted and, and not changed across the cluster. So there is a risk that the Chef server is a uh, security, uh, a very good security vector if someone wanted to compromise a cluster. Uh, there are ways that you can mitigate it, at least on the Chef server, such as using encrypted data bags. And uh, Chef Vault is a, uh, a cookbook that I'd like to see integrated right now. We've got encrypted data bag support, but we don't have Chef Vault support. Ideally, Chef Vault would allow you to say, okay, here are the different keys. So I could hand out keys to my cluster nodes that need to know all of the database passwords for that MySQL Galera. But machines that are developer desktops, so I want to install all of the, all the configurations so they know where an HDFS is, but they don't have any need to know what the uh, MySQL passwords are. Wouldn't have, the pass wouldn't have the ability to decrypt those passwords, and it would just be meaningless, meaningless data for them. So that way we can use the open source Chef server and still get multi-tiered security. Uh, we do the cluster orchestration scripts we have also do pull the admin privileges back from the nodes when they don't need it. So that way if someone were to compromise a node, they can still view the data, but they wouldn't be able to modify it. Hi. Sorry, I got a quick question. Sure. Here. I hear you, I just don't see you, so <laughs> thank, thank you, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> can you please talk a little bit more about the, how do you guys use the Ceph in Bloomberg? Yeah, yeah so uh, the OpenStack community, uh, or the OpenStack framework needs a distributed file system underneath, just like we, for Hadoop, need a, a distributed file system underneath. So Ceph, provides that in the OpenStack world. It's, okay, um, so you're in Ceph for the cloud, cloud stuff, not for MapReduce, so how No, so we've, we've done tests where we will use Ceph. Uh, so Ceph um, uh, Ink Tank, who was recently acquired by Red Hat, uh, provides Hadoop bindings. Uh, so it's uh, a Java to C layer, uh, Ceph being written in C++. And those Java bindings actually allow you to do HDFS calls into Ceph. So you can say, hey, I want to open this block, and the API is the exact same. Oh, excuse me, I want to open this file, and the API is the exact same. Or I want to write this file, and the API is the exact same. But instead of writing to HDFS, you're writing to Ceph. Okay, so this so provides you're able to run MapReduce job on, on Ceph? Yeah, so instead running MapReduce HDFS. jobs works well. Some of the challenges are um, HDFS has some awesome tunings recently. Uh, things like uh, locality, um, local caching, uh, things like uh, a lot of folks, it sounds like, can sometimes modify their block mapper to try to do locality placement in interesting ways that, that suits their needs. With Ceph, it's a completely different stack. So trying to rationalize between the two is difficult. But for the cloud integration, it makes a lot of sense. Um, Swift is another 
file, uh, distributed file system that provides a Hadoop HDFS binding, but Swift is all, as I understand it, um, restful. So the API calls have a fairly high overhead, and uh, it's not as not as suitable for for MapReduce. So that's at least why Ceph seems seems really clean in that regard. We have another question. Thank you. Um, could you elaborate on the use of Kafka in your stack? Uh, yeah. So um, you know we really like the model that that LinkedIn's been been showing folks with Kafka to be able to use it for data ingestion. And uh, so for us to be able to have it with the Hadoop, Hadoop stack makes good sense. Now that said, uh, all the components are composable. So you can make one cluster be your Kafka cluster and another cluster be your Hadoop cluster, all under the same Chef server. But that way you've got a Kafka specific zookeeper and a Kafka specific node. And then you've got your Hadoop nodes. And so you aren't challenging for IO. So that's kind of how it works in the stack at least. Uh, one other, um, so no Ambari, Ambari provides provisioning. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, uh, sorry I came in late, but no in terms of a dashboard or management monitoring, did you roll your own or what's? So we've got Zavix and Graphite, and certainly we're trying to, it's much more mature on our eco stack, uh, open stack side, but uh, Zavix uh, to be able to do the alarming and Graphite to be able to provide dashboards. Uh, Chef itself otherwise, just to be able to make sure that demons stay up. So Chef is running on a periodic basis. Certainly it's not enough that if you had something that's for whatever reason caused half of your cluster to just abort on, on some of its nodes. Uh, but it'll ensure that if something has a, a you know, a out, of, out of heap or something, it'll keep running and, and be brought back up. Um, the, the dashboard that Ambari provides is really awesome. What I'd love to see is the Chef recipes actually call the rest uh, REST interfaces into Ambari, and for Ambari to be able to query the Chef server to figure out where nodes are running. We'll see if someday that's, uh, that's integrated. Uh, the comment was, uh, Ambari used to use Puppet, and now they've gone to pure Python for their orchestration, so um, certainly a, a very cool, cool stack. Any other questions? Have you used Vagrant or Salt to do any kind of a Hadoop deployments? So this actually uses Vagrant for the Chef server uh, and for the, the rollout. So again, the, the process of being able to deploy this for kind of development purposes is on VirtualBox. So you can take a laptop with 32 gigs of RAM and you can run the automated install script that actually brings up an entire cluster by taking a Vagrant box, because we need Ubuntu at some point, we'd like to do that without human intervention. So you can take an open source Vagrant box with Ubuntu and install that as your bootstrap node. You can then put Chef and Cobbler, Cobbler being the Pixie boot part, and Chef being the, uh, of course, the, the configuration management part. And then you can bring up three VirtualBox VMs that have a Pixie boot ROM and nothing else. The hard disks are all blank, and you can actually run some shell scripts on that bootstrap node, that Vagrant node, to bring them up. And the really key, very useful pattern for being able to deploy kind of a golden image of a cluster is when that Vagrant box is determined to be satisfactory for a cluster, you can then actually make that Vagrant box go back to being a box, just a single tarballed file, and be able to actually copy that onto a cluster, change the networking from host internal virtual box networks to being actually a, another member on the physical network, and it will stand up bare metal machines. And so we, we use Vagrant pretty heavily in the stack uh, for that. Uh, Salt, uh, Salt, Puppet, CF Engine, they're all fantastic configuration management tools. Just Chef had the, the right mind share for us and it, it worked out well. I think that's... Uh, yeah, question, yeah. last one. Oh, sorry, yeah. Tahisha, is everything? Yeah. One more? Okay. Is it uh, RPM-based install or repo? S uh, could you ask that one more time? Is it, uh, no, are you installing using the RPMs or repo-based install? of repo-based or something else based of what? Uh, repo, like, you know, let, let's say you want to, you can set up a uh, repo, right? Um, so yeah. yeah, so we've got the uh, Chef, the Git repository. My apologies, I'm just not quite hearing the speakers no. aren't great on the podium. Yeah, yeah, how exactly you're getting the installer packages, you know, Th that's my question, like, you know, uh, do you have all the RPMs? Oh, um, so yeah, the chef will, will translate. Uh, so if you run it on a, a CentOS-based system, uh, sorry, that was asked a little earlier. Uh, if you run it on a CentOS or uh, Red Hat uh, enterprise Linux-based system, chef will actually do the RPM-based install instead of a Debian 
the package based install. So that means you are uh, uh, downloading all the RPMs and keeping it local? So yeah, we set up an apt mirror so that way that Vagrant box, when we bundle it up, has everything it needs. So we, we have all the binaries for the gems, for the chef packages itself, and uh, for the uh, Hadoop distribution as well. And so all of that's served, served by that Vagrant PM. It's just a, a common pattern in enterprises. I've seen few enterprises willingly pull stuff from the internet uh, in a production mode. So it makes sense to, to have that be part of that golden image. Okay, uh, one more question. Like, you know, how frequently uh, you upgrade the uh, recipes? Like, you know, so do you do only for the major releases or? The, these are under active development. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at the change change commit logs, you'll definitely see uh, daily we, we are touching this. Um, and so, yeah, we welcome pull requests. And thank you. <laughs>